as always, a beautiful, beautiful song and praise to Christ our King. When your soul cries out, hallelujah, Woo. you're getting a little warmed up. That was good. Did the voice break through, Bobby, or is it still kind of, you know? <clears throat> that's, that song come out? <clears throat> I think I heard you say, hallelujah, <laughs> with a deeper voice. Amen. Turn to Daniel chapter number two. Just kidding. <laughs> Couldn't do it justice like you, Doc. No way. I'm going to stay in my stay in your lane, bro. That's what I got to do. First Corinthians chapter number seven. Chapter number seven. We're going to finish it up. We're going to cover a few verses today and uh, finish up this chapter. I'll give you a tiny little review to get us back on track. Last, uh, last Sunday we had missions on Sunday and there's a really neat piece of scripture there, uh, kind of the, uh, the bridge piece between the first half of the chapter talking about marriage and we talked of uh, God's marriage disciplines two weeks ago and today we're going to talk about good advice from God for single people. And so uh, for all of you that are not single here, maybe you can pass it on to someone. We're going to use the scripture like we always do and uh, see what God teaches us. In this chapter, Paul really directs really strong teaching toward, um, hey, you're considering marriage, but you're single. What are you going to do? What ought you to do? Where is it all laid down for God and his word? So we're going to do that today. Um, and I'm reminded, again, when you just see the artwork up on the screen, you see Love Never Fails and, and where this series has already taken us, we're reminded that you know God has already taught us so much in this book and we've only uh, made about 40% of it and we've got a little ways to go. But uh, we're going to talk again about marriage a little bit, but from another side. Uh, keep in mind that, um, as it says up there, God's marriage disciplines were set forth by Paul. And God put him in there, and Paul, of course, calls himself unmarried. And again, it, it leads for you to consider he's unmarried. And in the translation, in the Word of God, in the King James, and clearly there's uh, three different categories of the people of being uh, unmarried, being widows, and being virgins, and he calls himself unmarried. Which makes you wonder, is it possible, though we do not have an exact account, was he married and uh, once he became a believer, his life changed and he no longer was? I do not know that. I've talked to many pastors over the years and as we have landed, if the word of God does not say it, we do not know. But it's, it's, it's open to looking and saying, okay, why does he say unmarried? But he's saying and teaching here about God's marriage disciplines. And he did that in the first few verses. I think we, if I'm not mistaken, we covered the first 16 verses. Uh, and he said, you know, God's marriage disciplines will bring you this marriage that is godly. But still, he spoke about staying unmarried to the Lord. Remember, up on the screen, we highlight 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, verses 6 and 7. And uh, even I'll include eight in reading it, but it says, but I speak this by permission. Remember, it's in your scripture right before you on your, in your Bible, on your lap, and not of command. For I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, not one after this manner, another and another after that. If you even include verse number eight as he's saying it there, he's saying, look, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows... It is good for them if they abide, even as I. So what is he saying? It is good for them if they abide, even as I. The unmarried and the widows. So again, here's Paul in his single state. He's single. And of course, in those first few verses, he spoke of all those different marriage disciplines. Remember, marriage is for many reasons. It could be looked at in scripture-wise. I mean, Genesis Chapter number two tells us it's for partnership. Genesis chapter number one tells us for, for, for uh, procreation. Of course, Ephesians 5, it's a beautiful picture of the believer and the Lord Jesus Christ in that relationship from Ephesians 
5.22 through 33. If you look, of course, 1 Corinthians 7, right there, verse number 2. Another P word. Uh, marriage is for purity. Look. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every man, I mean every woman, have her own husband. We chuckled about that, but clearly the society will tell you that marriage is multiple different combinations. No. A man has his wife and a woman has her husband. God says, amen. And that's the way it ought to be. But it's partly, of course, for purity and many others. It's for pleasure, as it says in Proverbs 5. So God's marriage disciplines, they're set forth by Paul, and we want these marriages and the marriage to be godly. But he's saying, hey, you know, if you would and you could uh, to be like me, but he's not saying it as a commandment. Also, marriage is ordained by God, and it's a great thing. But it is not to take priority over the believer's relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's where we're going to head today in a little deeper way. If you're single today in the audience, that's one part. But maybe you weren't single and now you are. Or maybe as a married person, you know people that are single and you're saying, how are they supposed to navigate through this considering this world teaches so many messy things? Well, that's the point. The Word of God is clear that it's not its worldly way that it's teaching. God's word is totally contrary to the world, and the world will teach things contrary. Remember in verse number 3, even in, in, in 1 Corinthians 7, that marriage has something to do with the husband rendering unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise the, mar uh, the, the wife to the man. Due benevolence, the love of another person to promote the other's happiness. We'll talk about that. We're not to defraud one another, it says in verse number 5. Again, just a good, good review. Defraud ye not one the other. Remember, we looked at the meaning of defraud. To deprive of some right or property that is due someone. And do it by a deceitful manner to actually, in a devilish way, to cheat someone. And I just didn't say to cheat on someone. I said to cheat them. In a marriage, not to defraud. So the marriage is ordained by God. It's a great thing. But again, it is not to take priority over the believer's relationship with Jesus Christ. Just consider Luke chapter number 14. We know this one a little bit. It's one of those discipleship verses. It's to be a follower of Jesus. The word disciple means very simply learner. We oftentimes, and I've oftentimes in teaching discipleship over many years, a willing learner, someone who says, hey, teach me. I want to be like Christ. The verse says, and I put up Luke chapter number 14, and I started it out in verse number 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. For today's message, very simply, wife and life. He can't be my disciple if something is before me. As a single person, what's most important? As a married person, what's most important? Your relationship with Jesus Christ, because it says there, whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Again, those phrases, every time I read passage of scripture like this, it's a tough pill to swallow, but it's the truth of the word of God, and it's the truth of Jesus Christ as he's challenging those that are closest to him and all those that are surrounding saying, I believe, but I don't want to follow. I believe that I don't want to be a disciple. A disciple as a learner must attach himself to the teacher, Jesus, and say, your teaching for me is going to be the most beneficial. Sanctification is the most important thing for me. Holiness to be set apart unto the Lord. And it comes through discipleship. And a disciple making relationship. But again, it goes back to how that can formulate into something even greater. And that's the fact that I will love Jesus Christ supremely. I will see that love never fails no matter what. I will get the concept of the purpose, the focus, the thought of this man, Paul the Apostle, teaching this church and saying, love never fails. And everything that I teach you, love never fails. Charity never faileth. Love never fails. We've already covered so many different topics. We've covered the, the, the disunity in the church, how to have unity in the church. 
who talked about how serving yourself versus Christian servanthood. We've talked about a little bit, obviously, about morality. In fact, a lot about morality. Chapter 5, chapter number 6, we looked at, of course, fornication and immorality and adultery. We looked at, of course, the Holy Spirit of God and how the Spirit of God and all of this teaching to this letter to the church that as a church here today in 2022, we can glean from and say, you know what? Whew. God, you have put so many things before us so that we can fulfill what you've called us to. And when it comes to marriage, you said, hey, these are some marriage disciplines. Let me just highlight a couple of them. That I'm just going to review them. It won't be on the screen, but just to remind you of what we covered a couple weeks ago. Because this is what Paul is saying about marriage when love never fails. Remember I said, hey, confront sexual desires within yourself by God's word. That was one of those marriage disciplines. I also put in there to reconcile intimacy desires for your spouse by God's word, not to defraud, not to do, do benevolence. And we just read those a little bit ago. You know what? This marriage desire, I want to be married, but it's birthed out of lust, then I need to handle that by God's word, as it says. It's not, well, the Bible says, you know, for it is better to marry than to burn, so I'm just going to find somebody to marry because I have a difficult time handling my sexual desires. That's not what it says. But yet the world will tell you, well, just get married. I've known pastors that have taught that. Even if you're marrying the wrong person. Paul is not teaching that. Paul is teaching to seek God's will no matter what. To find God's will for your life and go after that passionately with every bit of your being. Because the word passion means suffering. So it's going to be a suffering thing, but a great reward to go after his will. To be sanctified, to be set apart to Jesus Christ. Married, single, divorced, widowed, whatever it may be. Paul's saying, guess what? God's marriage disp uh, disciplines, if you're married, is look. We diminish the divorce desires with hope by God's word. We can say, hey, well... She doesn't, she isn't, he isn't, they aren't. Well, it says if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage. But he said, wait a minute, God's called us to peace. 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 What if the person that's unbelieving is in the home and they're married to somebody who's a believer and they want to stay? No, you're going to boot them out? Paul said, I would rather have you that you did not do so. You say, I have no idea what it's like. Well, Paul's laying it before you. But he's saying, I would rather have it be that the unbelieving can be sanctified by the believing. That's what it says in the Bible. That's what we looked at a couple weeks ago. Because when it comes back down to it again, love never fails. Admittedly, many singles have difficulty with sin in leading the single life. I was single for quite a period of time. I got married when I was 26 years old. And I thank God that he saved my soul at 24. I was a wreck. I was a mess. As I've said often, Cheryl was the only woman I ever treated right in my life. And I thank God that he saved my soul. I'd never been married to her. Do not be mistaken to think, though, that marriage will solve your sin problems. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. This is what Paul teaches. Will getting married solve the sin problem for a single person, I ask? Just reiterating what I said. Only salvation, being born again, that starts the sin difficulty problem being erased. You're redeemed. You just sung about it. My debt is paid, it is paid in full. Hallelujah, salvation brings you no more bondage to sin. You're free. Now sanctification gets you going a little bit more. It progresses you to become more like Jesus Christ, to be predestinated, right? To be conformed to the image of Christ. And then you understand the Bible. Again, discipling people and being part of people's lives and just hanging out with them as they're learning the word. <laughs> It's so exciting. I was telling somebody uh, Thursday, Bobby, about when we used to sit in those Bible studies at, on, the, on the road trips. And uh, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. 
we came up with doctrine like, I don't know, you know. Well, what about the people in Africa? What about them? There was a Mennonite in that group. Larry Sheets, wasn't he a Mennonite? Is that correct? There was a born-again believer from Massachusetts that used to go into bars to witness to people and tear it up. He used to tear it up, man. And he did have the opportunity to lead some people to Christ. He also got into some heavy arguments. He would be, back then in the 80s, an apologist for Jesus Christ when it wasn't. And my point in that is salvation changed the bondage that we had to sin, and now we're slaves to Jesus in such a beautiful way. And so he was sanctifying us, and then we had people like Mike Metzger and, and people like that that taught us the Bible. And that's powerful because only salvation and sanctification can bring this home. So today I want you to really grasp the simple statement of our message. Before marriage advice. Well, why didn't you say advice before marriage? Because then I would be leading you to believe that this, mar this message is only for those that are going to get married. No. It's before marriage advice. Whether you, as a single person, get married or not. That's what Paul's approach is. Before marriage, here's the advice. We're not, we're not teaching the Bible enough. You say, well, we need to have more Sunday school classes on Sundays. No, I'm talking about you one-on-one -on -one with people. So that means you need to be discipled, trained, taught. You need to go to more of those, and then as you grow, then you can reproduce the fruit of the Word of God as the Spirit of God uses and works in you. And so you can open up a passage of Scripture and say, well, I heard somebody teach this, but I don't know much about it. Let me get four more podcasts, and they'll teach it four different ways. And you go, wait a minute, what's the Bible say? I'm always going to come back to what the Bible says. You know my preaching style. What does the Bible say? And we'll make a comment on what the Word of God says, and then we'll move next. We were taught by some good people. One of them was in the pulpit here just a few weeks ago. I learned an awful lot from you over all these years. Just teach the Bible. We're not, so let's do it, in, let's do it a little bit more. I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not, just, I'm not saying that in a negative. We, we need to take the effort to teach people the Bible. If every one of you teach one person a year the Bible, see, I'm not qualified yet. Give the office a call or contact one of our pastors. We have five of them, six of them on staff. We'll lead you and direct you into some form or fashion so that you can learn and grow, so that you can teach other people. Debbie Venable, keep on teaching little children what you're teaching them. You're preparing their hearts for when they can receive even more, and they love the milk that you're teaching them. Keep on doing it until the end. We agreed. You see, before marriage advice, you say, well, before marriage, someone can show you. You can take them and say, let me show you what the Bible says. It's not just for single people. It's for you and me to take, well, this message is indirectly toward me. Well, really? Watch the Holy Spirit speak to you right now. Here we go. Verse number 25. Follow along with me. Now, concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet... I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. Don't you love that statement? I'm speaking from a place where I've obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. That's a great start to this section, so here we go. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. What's the present distress? That he's been written to by other believers to cover this subject matter. So that's why he's saying this. He said, hey, what's going on back there in Corinth? Let me address it. Art thou bound unto a wife? Just kick her out of the house. No, seek not to be loosed. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. He says, wherever you're, whatever state you're in there with, to be content. Just stay there. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned, and if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep 
as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. Very simply saying, hey, be content. Again, I said it earlier. Well, if someone's weeping, I want to weep with them. If someone's not weeping, just, just be content with what you have in the spot that you're in. Verse number 32, down through the rest of the chapter. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried care for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his, please his wife. Therefore, excuse me, there is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Verse 35. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. A great reinforcement to attend upon the Lord without distraction. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and needs so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. Nevertheless, he that standeth fast, steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and is so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. Last two verses. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also that I have the Spirit of God. Join me just for a word of prayer before we just break some things down. Father, thank you for your word in this time. In the name of Jesus, just an introduction. We've already read a little bit of your word. We've highlighted some things and kind of done a review. And Father, it's done for your glory and for your honor, for your people that are in the audience today to hear from you. I pray that your Holy Spirit would really reveal things to each person here as only he can do. That his ministering office as the, as the teacher will teach the word of truth and the way that it needs to be taught in God, in just these next few minutes, may we have our eyes open, have our heart, our soul, our mind open to a deeper understanding of the Word of God, the truth of the living God. We love you because you first loved us. We give all this time back to you for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's the title up there again, Before Marriage Advice. Again, I think... What Paul said in verses 8 and 9 about, hey, I'd have you be single. You know, have you be unmarried. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it's good for them if they abide as I. And if thou, and if they cannot contain, verse 9, let them marry, for it is better to marry than burn. So, again, there's a lot covered in terms of marriage disciplines, but also the life of a single person. In the middle of all of that, he puts some neat things about, hey, when it comes right down to it, <laughs> brethren, let every man wherein is called there and abide with God, which means very simple, we're bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. We're to serve the Lord with everything that we have. So when you come to these verses and you see all that's wrapped in here, to break it down and to really just let the Word of God speak to us, I took this thought of, hey, this would be good advice. Be a good advice for me, good advice for you to pass on. Just like the Word of God's like that all the time. And you study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the Word of God, and then you, the Word of truth, and then you say, okay, here, let me pass this on to you. Let's use the Word of God. So, in my thinking this, very simply, must a Christian get married? Is it a requirement? Must 
a person who's single and devoted to the Lord only find a way to get married? Should they continually pray about the man or woman to marry? We've used that in speaking about raising our children and the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We think about when our kids get older and they will have the opportunity to marry. But even there, we're going to speak about a father's vow of chastity for his daughters to be not married. But if they so choose, we're even going to talk about that here because he, he covers it all. So, what's your determining factor? God, you've compelled me. You've given me this opportunity You've given me the ability to date a woman, to date a man, and they're godly and they love Jesus Christ. Well, hallelujah. Well, God, I got married when I was younger, and we were lost, and then one of us got saved, and the other one decided to stay and dwell with me. So I said, hey, they didn't want to depart. They stayed. And as the Bible teaches... And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. The unbelieving husband sanctified by the wife. The unbelieving wife sanctified by the husband. That's what the Bible teaches. Your children are now clean and that they're set apart unto God. So when we get to this place again of being single and what it teaches here, it's very, very helpful. And so again, before marriage advice. I'm just going to give you four advice tips according to the Word of God. Here's your first one. Number one says single life of a believer. The single life spares a believer the pressures of social norms. What do you mean? Well, let's look at the Bible. Concerning virgins, in verse number 25, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. He goes all the way through that. He said, verse number 27, If you're bound to a wife, seek not to be loosed. Whatever state you're in, I mentioned that earlier. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But if thou are married, thou hast not sinned. If a virgin Mary, she has not sinned. So he goes through that, and then he goes into verses number 29, 30, and 31. And we'll talk about that here. What is the social norm stuff? Well, you say, Pastor, the other side of it is that, hey, don't get married at all. That's one of the social norms. Wait till you're 30, 35, 40. How about one of the social norms is this? And we've lived together for so long, we might as well just get married. That's a social norm. A societal norm might be also this. Well, <laughs> I'm tired of the dating scene. I, I'm t as a believer, I can't find any good guys. I'll just marry the next believer I can find, and that'll be fine. How about church culture norms, which can be a church societal norm? Well, I can't believe you're not married yet. Is there something wrong with you? We do stuff like that. We look at people in a way that is totally and completely not biblical and not Christ-like. And we do it in a way that's demeaning and divisive and degrading. And not not to be so. That comes from the world creeping into our mind to talk with this cynical view. I'm not talking about sarcastic lightly, which is even dangerous in itself. But to be cynical about what it means to be single versus what it means to be married. You see, single life spares a believer... The pressures of social norms when it comes to the marriage side of it. Well, I wouldn't get married. It's been the worst decision of my life. Marriage is just, it's just a trap. It's just going to bind you to one woman all your life, one guy. You know what? <coughs> I wouldn't do it. Am I covering enough so far? There's a lot of societal norms out there. A single life dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ can spare a believer all of that. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. Stay single as long as you can until, or the other way around, 
being single in Jesus Christ is just fine. Whichever way. God's saying it's fine. It's not for you and I. It's for that person to get closer to the Lord. And you say, well, you're going to get into that stuff about caring for the world or not. Yes, but we're not talking about justifiable decision-making based on my flesh. You heard what I said. Justifiable decision-making based on my flesh or what somebody said or what I felt in that moment. Feelings are fine and emotions are fine, but boy, when they drive our decisions that are most important in our lives, it is foolishness. You'll get yourself in trouble. But again, emotions are fine. God gave them to you. Feelings are good. But if they're going to make your decision for you on one of the most important things of your life, you're crazy. You're putting yourself, you're setting yourself up. That's why Paul says, let me grab 29 through 31 and reiterate it just for a few seconds here. But this I say, brother, and the time is short. I heard that, right? You know, life is a vapor, appear for a little time, and vanisheth away. We read that verse at funerals and we think that's the only time to read it. I read it to you now. Time is short, believers. You say, well, is that the, you know, uh, the predestined? Pre but no, 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 I'm just talking about your time is short. You get 70 years, boy, they go by fast. They run by fast. So time is short. You're a believer. You're going to be in the presence of the Lord one day. Woohoo! Time is short. So a person who's single, time is short. A person who's married, time is short. It's okay. Okay, time is short. So what's my perspective of time is short? I need to start thinking of eternal things more. You know what we're talking about. In Christ alone. How are we going to do mission work? In Christ alone. How are we going to do the sports thing? In Christ alone. How are we going to do family? In Christ alone. I need to do it eternally. Set my affections on things above, not on things of this earth. Okay, that sounds pretty good. That must have been a really good Acts 1-8 conference theme. It was. And the man that preached it did a whole lot better than I could do. The time is short and remaineth both that have wives be as though they had none. So, well, I have wife, or I be as I don't have one. It's fine either way. He's saying time is short. Stay with what you've been given and get after it so that you're seeking God's will. What? They that weep as though they weep, wept not. And that, it's almost like we're never contented. Well, I want to cry because they're crying. I want to rejoice because they're rejoicing. How about if you just rejoice because God has put it in your heart to rejoice? Well, the example of other people is important. Yes, it is. But to make a decision based upon what somebody else is doing or somebody's not doing, that's a dangerous place. And that's what he's saying here. Single life spares a believer the pressures of social norms. Because social norms want you to make decisions based upon what everybody else is doing. Doesn't it? Peer pressure hasn't gone away yet, has it? I heard it's still around, isn't it? Everywhere. And it's on you, too. At 60-something years old or at 6 years old, there is peer pressure all the time. And he says there, hey, verse 31, and they that use this world or as not abusing it, they do it well, for the fashion of this world passeth away. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My words shall not pass away. Your second piece of advice is up on the screen right here. Married life. Remember, this is coming from the side of some really good advice before marriage. Mary, life drives a believer to be preoccupied with another. Now, you're going to get in a lot of trouble, so don't raise your hand. But those of you who are married, are you a selfish person? We're all kind of selfish, aren't we? Has God been allowed with the beautiful presence of Jesus Christ by his word to make you unselfish? If you're single and you're selfish, please, I would have you consider to get more of Jesus Christ to be less selfish and more like him before you jump in. Because when you get married, you are preoccupied with another person. That's what it says. The Bible clearly teaches that you are to give due benevolence to the other person. You're not to withhold from the other person. You say, that's just physical, sexual stuff. No, do not defraud the other person and hold back anything from them. 
If you, oh, I got my stuff and they got their stuff, what's mine is mine and what's hers is mine, and I got everything. Married life drives a believer to be occupied, preoccupied with another. You're a single person, this is a really big one. You better sort this one out. That means go seek God's will and get a little deeper and closer into God's will. Because boy, oh boy, as a believer, if you married the wrong person, or you end up marrying them. Go to Luke 14. We have a minute. I won't take long here. Luke 14. I was there earlier. I just want to hit this real fast. I'm just going to hit it as a highlight. Luke 14, Jesus Christ, in verse number 16, is telling a parable that ties together with him coming into someone's house and how he's treated as an invited guest. So here he is teaching this very simple story, simple parable, great truth here. Verse 16, then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper, bade many, sent his servant at the supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. What happens in verse 18? There's an excuse. What's the first excuse? Well, I got this piece of ground and I got to go see it. That's beautiful. You were given this invitation and you were bidden to come long before the, they actually got the actual inv invitation of the date. And yet you know the teaching. He said, nope, I've got to go take care of some land. Is that a married person or not? I'm not reading into the scripture. But it's possible that person has to go take care of their job. Go take care of their farming. Go take care of their land. Verse number 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. Another excuse. Please excuse me, right? If that's the type of person, as a single person you are, then... I pray if you say, hey, I'm going to get married and marry this lady, I'm going to marry this man, that you'll let God do an incredible work in your life to consecrate you unto him first so that you can be the man or woman that you need to be to be preoccupied with another. Because verse number 20 tells me this. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. That substantiates and supports everything. Now there are going to be times where you're going to have to take care of things at home and you're going to have to go take care of your wife. So as a single person, be aware, as the Bible teaches, as Jesus taught, as Paul taught, you as a married person, if that's going to happen, before marriage advice, you as a believer have to be preoccupied with the other person. And by the way, you can't play the game both ways. Well, I don't want to be around her, so I'm going to go serve Jesus Christ. Well, I'm, I'm just being faithful to Jesus when you're staying away from the home that you're supposed to be preoccupied with your wife. Watch it. How about the other side? I'm preoccupied with my wife because the Bible says I'm supposed to and I'm not going to go serve Jesus. You see, when you get married, you've got to do both. Do both. Well, that's where God will equip you to do so. Because remember, Ephesians 5 is a beautiful picture of a believer in Jesus Christ and how the church and the bride, the bride Jesus, and, uh, excuse me, the bride, the church, and with the groom Jesus, it's the same picture, but the believer in Jesus, okay? So when you're preoccupied with the other person, just remember that as a believer, being preoccupied means also, too, you can serve the Lord. You just need to do it the right way. Number three piece of advice is this. Single life protects a believer promised to another by culture. Let me explain to you what this passage says. Verse number 36. It's very important. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and needs so to require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. Now before I read the next couple of verses, keep in mind the cultural thing going on here. Jewish culture. Other culture there. By the way, the Corinthian culture was a mess. Some of them got married once, twice, three times, five times, ten times. So that's why he puts in some of those passages of, hey, you have a wife? Then don't get rid of her. Well, you say that it's better to be single. No, 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 no. Don't flip the word of God to meet again your flesh. What is he saying here? He's saying that there is a cultural norm in a good way back there in many cultures, especially in the Jewish culture where they would say, hey, got three daughters, two daughters, four daughters. Two of them were setting apart and dad has vowed with the daughter, the daughter has vowed to be chaste. This chastity means that this daughter was saying, hey, I vowed unto the Lord, I put away to the Lord and so 
I'm just going to be unto the Lord forever. But verse number 37 gives you an idea what Paul's covering here. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. The father says, hey, she wants not to ever get married? Fine. That's okay. Keep her. She's fine. What does it say in verse number 38? So then, as Paul's writing to the dads, the fathers, about their daughters, their virgin, so then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well. He gave her to marry. You, you did a good thing. Because she decided she wanted to be married. It's not sinful. But he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. Very simply. If the person, this daughter, decides that she wants to be a virgin... And she's going to be like that, and dad's covering all of her life, and she has dad's covering for all of her life. Correct? That's the Bible. It's Old Testament and New Testament completely all throughout. But if she says, oh, dad, this man is a believer. He loves the Lord. Well, okay. And there you go from the old to the new. May I have your daughter in marriage? Because he had her as the father set aside as a virgin not to be married. You see, very simply, single life protects a believer promised to another by culture. Because sometimes on the other side, they were promised to other people in arranged marriages. Follow? So Paul's dealing with cultural stuff throughout here. He covers everything concerning virgins, unmarried, widows, it all. Don't intertwine and mix them around. Again, verse 36, but if any man think that he behaveth himself uncommonly to get toward his virgin, he shall pass the flower of her age. And Well, she needs to get married. She just needs to get married. I need to, I need to find a, a, a husband for my daughter who's been living off a of dad this whole time and I'm going broke. <laughs> he laughed. <laughs> I figured Bobby and Dwayne would laugh. We've got a few daughters between us. Ten of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you God for Andrew Brogan. No, she's not in this service right now. So. No, no. She was making her own way. She didn't Chastity for my little girls forever, fine. But unless the daughter is insistent to be married, fine. So the father has made a, a vow with the daughter, but if the daughter says, I would like to be married, okay, let's see what person this is because the arrangement of the culture. You see? Understand? Very good. Last one. Here's your last piece of advice for today when it comes to single people. Again, before marriage advice. Married life binds a believer to fulfill the permanency of the vow. And here you go, single people. I'm going to give you a peek into what marriage can be like, has to be like, and what God meant it to be. I mentioned provision and procreation and all those fun little P words. I'm going to go a little further here, make an application to the Scripture. Because it says again here in verse number 39 and 40, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. She can marry anybody she wants. No, no, no. Only in the Lord. Believers marry believers. That's a good way to go. Well, the woman could have been married to someone who was not a believer. And he dies. And now, okay, you have a chance to marry. Don't marry an unbeliever this time. Don't marry a godly guy. Or stay single. Because that's what verse 40 says here. It's okay. It says, hey. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. Don't you love the Bible? All of it. This God just puts one of those in there. Oh, by the way, you have the Spirit of God to discern, to show discretion, to make a decision. Just like he said back there in verse number 24, 25, 26 about, hey, brethren, let every man wherein is called there and abide with God. 
Verse number 25, obtain mercy of the Lord to be faithful. The word of God's constantly interjecting the author and the finisher of your faith, continually interjecting the one that wrote it, the spirit of the living God, through the hands of the men and the people that wrote it. The father of all creation, the God of all glory, he intertwines his glory everywhere. And that's what it's coming back to. Married life binds a believer to fulfill the permanency of the vow. Do you know what marriage is supposed to be like? Can I just speak a final word here? Because it's still God's will. It's still being more like Jesus Christ. It's still sanctification through being discipled after your salvation to deal with sin. It's not that when you get married, it'll take care of your sin. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Because chapter 7 teaches us just some simple things. The sacredness of marriage. The duty of winning the lost spouse to Jesus Christ. The importance of contentment wherever you're at and whatever your situation you're in. That salvation does not eliminate your social responsibilities. There's a lot here. You see, look up there and realize married life binds a believer to to fulfill the permanency of the vow. You say, well, God says in the Bible that you can't get a divorce. You're changing God's word. He makes provision for things. Adultery, an abandonment of the believer versus an unbeliever. Because it's it right here. There's another way that you can get a divorce, bill of divorcement if the spouse dies. He just covered it. But Jesus said, for the hardness of your heart, that bill of divorcement was written in the Old Testament. So look back up there again. You're single? Look out. What you're going to get into is serious stuff. Married life binds a believer to fulfill the permanency of the vow and stop letting the societal norms determine whether you can or can't. I don't know how hard it's going to be. Jesus Christ will get you through every single thing. And I'm here to tell you, that's the only one that taught me how to love my wife. He is the only one. I was a filthy, rotten reprobate before I was saved. I treated women like awful. And that's all I'll say about that. I never say things publicly about that. But Paul the Apostle, he was Saul, and he consented for people to be murdered. You think he was a great guy? And he's writing to say that if you're going to get into this and you're going to get married, then you better understand that there's a permanency to your vow. There's, no, there's, there's a permanency to your vow when you call in the name of the Lord to save you. He's got you in spiritual circumcision. Now you say, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I'm going to hate everything else and just love you more than anything else in the world. Believers, we need to kick it up a notch. And we kick it up a notch, then when it comes to these things, you can say, well, let me open up the Bible and show you that. If you're going to get married and you're still single, this is the stuff. And it's very serious, and it should be more serious than we really treat marriage. It's very serious stuff. Isn't it, Nathan and Nikki? Serious stuff. And I know you're serious about your marriage, and I love you for that, both of you. The fashion of this world is going to pass away in your marriage. It's going to pass away. How will you treat your spouse? Marriage, we're taught, lastly, that the personal relationships of life should not hinder our love and our walk with the Lord. No spouse should ever get in the way of your walk with the Lord. Get after it. It's her fault. No, God's not going to let that go. That's his fault. Ain't going to go. Just doesn't work that way. Paul clearly said so. Here's your invitation prayer. Here you go. Put it up on the screen for me, Bebop. Ultimately, the greatest advice for us all is to fulfill God's will. Because that's pretty sad. Well, yeah, fulfill God's will. And do it for his glory. Sometimes people fulfill God's will and do all this. No, it's not for your martyrdom. It's not for you to get a pat on the back. It's for you and I fulfill God's will for his glory. It's for his glory. He gets back the glory. He gets the glory for my marriage. I don't get any of it. He has put us together and kept us together. And I thank God for that. So I got to seek God's will. And for his glory, I'm going to make a worse mess of my marriage than I've done up to this point. Here's your time of prayer today. 
I pray that you make it serious. Here's the next slide. Let's pray for single believers today. You say you're not one. I didn't say that. I said let's pray for single believers in their search for God's will. They could use some prayer. Just like married people when we prayed a couple weeks ago. People could use some prayer that are single. And even still, marriages could use your prayer too. There's a lot of hurt in marriage. There's a lot of hurt in single people too. But we can pray the comfort of the Holy Spirit in their lives right now to walk them through to find God's will for their lives. Please bow your head for a word of prayer as we enter our prayer time as I invite you to that. As my sound guy starts some music, let me pray with you and pray for you. Our Father in heaven, we love you so much. Your love has never failed me and never failed any of us, though we have failed you. I thank you for your forgiveness, your grace, your mercy, your goodness, your love upon my soul and for all my brothers and sisters here in the name of Jesus. I pray for this time of prayer that you will just anoint it and bless it and be in the midst of it all as you've spoken to us about the vitality, the importance of marriage. But most of all, you've spoken to us through Paul the Apostle and the Holy Spirit about what it means to be single and completely devoted to you or married and devoted to you just to seek your will. I pray that this time is a sheer blessing to you, that it is a sweet savor unto you as we pray in Jesus' name. Please stand.